started. Welcome, everyone. I'm Swapna Reddy, Clinical Associate Professor at Arizona State University's College of Health Solutions. I also serve as an adjunct professor at the Mayo Clinic Alex School of Medicine, and my particular areas of research and teaching and just sort of general interest are in how the policy, how law and policy help to um, and can be used to improve health outcomes with a specific interest in issues relating to underserved women and children. I am absolutely delighted to join you as moderator for today's webinar, and I'd like to thank you for joining our Health Talks webinar brought to you by the College of Health Solutions at ASU. Our college works to address the challenges facing people and communities to stay healthy, improve their health, and manage chronic disease. These health talks are one way that we serve the community with timely and relevant educational information that also provides continuing education credit at absolutely no cost. And for now, and so here's a couple of quick kind of housekeeping items that we need to go through. First, this session is being recorded and will be posted on our website, asuhealthtalks.com. After the panel's presentations, I will moderate a Q&A session. So please submit your questions using the Zoom Q&A function kind of at the bottom of your screen there and not the chat box, please. And finally, you will receive a brief survey after we're all done. Uh, and we would really appreciate your input on today's webinar. If you're requesting continuing education credits, this must be completed in order to receive that credit. If you did not apply for continuing education credits, we'll still appreciate your feedback to improve our series. So presenting together today is James G. Hodge Jr. and Jennifer Piat. James is the Peter Kiewit Foundation Professor of Law at ASU's Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law and Director of the Center for Health Policy Law and Policy at ASU. Through scholarship, teaching, and applied projects, he delves into multiple areas of health law, public health law, global health law, ethics, and human rights. James regularly publishes a column on public health law for the Journal of Law, Medicine, and Ethics, and advises federal, state, and local governments on public health law and policy issues. Jen is a research scholar and co-director of the Center for Public Health Law and Policy at the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law at Arizona State University, where she concentrates her work on areas of reproductive rights and health access emergency preparedness and response, and vaccinations. Jen's expertise is demonstrated through her authorship of two textbook chapters on public health emergency law and over 50 articles in publications, including the American Journal of Public Health, Jim Health Forum, and more. We are so fortunate to have both of these health experts with us today with a combined presentation titled SCOTUS Top 5 Impacts 2024 Health Law and Public Health Law. James will start us off and then Jen, Jen will step kind of right on in a little bit later. So James, before I give you the floor, thank you all so much. Everyone for joining us this is an incredibly important topic today and always. Um, and once again, please remember to put any questions you have throughout the conversation and definitely closer to that 12 40 mark in the Q&A piece at the bottom of the screen. So James, you have the floor. Take it away, friend. Well, Swapna, thank you so much for that gracious introduction. And we're delighted to be able to join this audience today as well. So thank you. And I'm really just always pleased that my great colleague, Jen Pyatt, and I will be able to kind of present to you all on this specific topic. It's so critical. It's happening. And the topic of which we're about to address is going to garner some questions. So we're going to leave plenty of time for that. Let me share screen so you'll have a good sense of what we've got on stake for our presentation here today with just a moment to make sure we're seeing it in full slide mode. So we're going to talk about a very tough topic of all of the Supreme Court related activities that impact us in the health law and public health arena. Jen and I are going to nail it down to top five, but we got a little bonus round here too. So Jen's going to bring it home back to Arizona in relation to some of how these top five choices carries through. Let me show you or give you a little sense of what we try or will try to accomplish here in this next 20 to 30 minutes in that respect. And do so with the hope that the background, whether you come at this from a core legal background, a policy perspective, whether you're untrained in law or policy, our objective is to make sure this is as clean and as critical and as, as hopefully helpful for you as it can be. Make your questions relevant for us so we can help you think through these really critical, tough issues. I'm going to first just give you kind of a very brief overview of just how much this current U.S. Supreme Court is impacting what we do in the United States. I'll be brief. It'll get us right to our top five current impactful cases. And for each of these five cases, Jen and I are going to break these down for your benefit with like essentially 
what are the premier questions that the United States Supreme Court in D.C. are asking or addressing in that specific case? And then even more to the point for our purposes today, why is that relevant? What is the direct potential public health impact of what this court can and will do with its decisions forthcoming before June 30th? And then we'll give you a little perspective forecast. None of the cases that we're going to highlight for you today have decisions for us that we can actually tell you straight up what the impacts are, because we're awaiting these from this U.S. Supreme Court. But Jen and I'll forecast it. We'll give you a little weather forecast of types of how we're seeing this potential play out. Questions, thoughts, comments towards the end? We're looking forward to those especially. It's not like we're coming new to this party, not having done this for several years now. Jen and I consistently, you know, always are watching the sort of judicial developments at the highest levels of courts in the United States. This includes state Supreme Courts, like what we've seen in Arizona recently, and includes, of course, the United States Supreme Court. Over the last two years, we have predicted somewhat accurately of the really significant impacts this court's made in public health, health care, health law and policy over the last two years. And each year, we think we've reached the climax of how much more this court can impact what we're doing in the United States. But I'm not sure that's the case because this court continues to provide profound illustrations of new constitutional arguments and issues, changing the game for our law students here at ASU Law that we try to instruct, for all the federal, state, tribal, local partners that we work with. They're asking the tough questions because this court's demanding a complete reassessment of a lot of core constitutional principles. Now, one of the things that we do, and we love our colleagues to be aware of what you know we're at. Uh, in regards to ASU law and how we actually think through this stuff. We have a monthly sort of uh, document that Jen and I put out with additional colleagues on our center, basically looking at SCOTUS impacts. We call it Public Health Law Updates or FLU. This is available on our center website. We highly recommend you look at it if you're just trying to get a sense of what's happening right now in this arena. Our most recent issue up as of April 15th focuses nicely on First Amendment related repercussions for the obvious reasons of what you're going to see in the near future with several cases from the court. These are the types of cases we're tracking right now. These are the types of cases all across the country that we're watching really carefully among the sort of, even what we just consider like 10 impactful related cases. It's tough for us just to take these 10 and find these from the amalgam of everything the U.S. Supreme Court does, because when you see what underlies these cases all across the United States, the topical matters of what this court is addressing and its potential to impact public health and health care delivery in the United States these are profound, impactful topics. All of what you're going to see today is Jen and my expertise to suggest, even among all these specific topics, there are five that we will hone in. Sometimes, though, what we track is not just what the court is doing. It's what it's chosen not to do. Sometimes that's beneficial for what and how we could actually receive public health policy in the future. So, for example, these three cases, Biden versus Feds for Medical Freedom, the court turned down an opportunity to actually assess whether President Biden had complete COVID-19 vaccination mandate authority for federal employees. In Atchison Hotels versus Lawford, the court largely threw away an Americans with Disabilities Act case involving reservation rules at hotels, chose not to actually address it on standing grounds. And in Students for Fair Admission versus West Point, notwithstanding a prior decision in which the court essentially rescinded affirmative action in regards to so much of what, so much of what we see with race-based admission policies that shows not to apply that to at least the academy or the um, military academies. Sometimes what the court doesn't do is advantageous because decisions on these fronts could have been problematic. These five decisions in this specific order is what Jen and I are going to focus on now. First, we'll go across the other side of the country to Loper Bright versus Ramondo. We'll discuss Chevron deference. If you don't know what that is, you're about to figure it out in the next 30 seconds, and then we'll show you exactly what's on this, what's on the table. I'll then take you to Grants Pass versus Johnson in Oregon. Grants Pass, Oregon has a very new proposal that's actually in consideration by the Supreme Court to address homelessness in the community. Profound repercussions you'll see in just a moment. I'll then turn it over to Jen. She'll take us into Missouri, Murphy versus Missouri, incredibly first, uh, incredible First Amendment case involving online misinformation, and then take us into the heart of where the Supreme Court is right now on reproductive rights with two critical cases. FDA versus Alliance, Idaho versus United States. All right, let's jump into it as follows. 
We're talking about a decision here, Loper, as well as another one called Relentless. They're the, basically the same case, just two different uh, jurisdictions and the same basic set of issues. I'm going to tell you straight up, you don't want to know all the facts of these cases. This specific case involves highly obscure language from an obscure federal statute. It's about requiring surveillance of, of fishermen out at sea in regards to safety-related measures. It's the sort of thing that you just have to pluck out of a federal statute and challenge, not because of the resistance that fishermen in the United States out on the Atlantic and other places have to having to do specific measures for assessing you know, their, their safety or quality or what have you. It's because of the opportunity it presents to completely recast what level of agency deference we're going to subscribe to in the United States. Yeah, Loper and Relentless or about to what degree do we have to give significant deference to agency interpretations of standing statutory provisions? Hey, that's what's at stake. And if you're wondering, so why is this important for public health purposes? Uh, for these reasons, what is known as Chevron deference, that traditional 30 plus year deference given to agencies that the Supreme Court crafted in 1984 has been in place for so long and it essentially gave agencies that ability to say when there are ambiguities in federal statutes, we're going to defer to a large degree to agency interpretations. That's worked to our benefit in health law, public health law, and healthcare practice for decades. So when HHS, CMS, CDC, or others are dealing with amorphous federal statutes like they did repeatedly throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, and we are able to give them judicially deference to what interpretation they provide, there's a continuity and stability to that that we have counted on for decades. That's about to get overturned. As even the Solicitor General, Elizabeth Prelegar, noted in regards to her oral arguments here, overruling Chevron said to the court would be a convulsive shock to the legal system. That is exactly what this court seems proposed to do. As Justice Kagan noted in oral arguments that happened a few months ago in relation to this specific case in Loper, or actually I think she made these in the Relentless case, again, the companion case, <clears throat> very similar facts, She's pointing out very effectively a fact here related to what this court may be prepared to do in the interest of separation of powers and other fronts to displace longstanding agency deference with actually unknown standards, not yet crafted by this court as to how much deference we have to give to agencies. The court seems quite intent on giving less deference and requiring more uh, specific uh, sort of provisions from, from Congress on specific fronts. As Justice Kagan notes in this specific quote, what or how are we supposed to expect continuity or stability in this specific environment? You know, what or how will we expect agencies like FDA to set what the terminology is for specific things like what is or is not a dietary supplement? Do we really want to have to question that judicially, repeatedly? That's a major factor at work. And I'm telling you straight up, my prediction here is stormy seas. Almost everybody sees Chevron deference out the door and replaced with something we can't yet predict. But get ready for an era of having to reassess what exactly Congress has given agencies authority to do and when and how Congress will be repeatedly asked to actually specify with greater detail that specific amount. And just imagine the repercussions for federal agencies working in the healthcare sector. And then you've got this case out of Grants Pass, Oregon, a delightful mountain town in Oregon in which they are simply trying to do what several towns have worked towards for the last several decades address to whatever degree they can, homelessness within their community. So how did Grants Pass Oregon go about trying to address these specific issues? Well, they passed a series of anti-camping, anti-loitering, anti-sitting around, don't stand around too long in Grants Pass Oregon homeless. Because if you do, and we catch you three or four times doing that, we're gonna penalize you, fine you, we're going to ban you from public property. We're get, taking away your options to be homeless here in Grants Pass, Oregon. The seriousness of what's at stake here is because the Ninth Circuit, which oversees Oregon as well as Arizona, has made clear on multiple occasions this sort of restrictive provisions at the city or state level. It's unquestionably an Eighth Amendment cruel and unusual punishment violation. You're essentially telling homeless persons you have nowhere to go and you cannot use public lands for any purposes of loitering or otherwise. The repercussions are profound. 
I'm telling you straight up, this could, based on this decision, which we have yet to see oral arguments that are forthcoming on Monday, April 22nd, this could totally recast and change how we handle homelessness all across the nation. Now, we've seen recently in Phoenix how we've handled situations like what you're seeing here out of Washington State, but the reality is this is game-changing because if this Supreme Court does reverse what we see now in the Ninth Circuit uh, and takes away any Eighth Amendment violation here, we've got a potential to address homelessness through laws and policies that could be patently discriminatory and highly problematic, for sure. My prediction here is really quite simple. It's not good. Frigid era in relation to what could be a post-Grants Pass, post-Eighth Amendment protection environment in which the Supreme Court's essentially saying these persons experiencing homelessness in the United States in excess of 650,000 post-COVID don't have the protections that they might have used to enjoy for the last several decades as well. We'll see where this comes to pass, but to be sure, very interesting, very compelling. As far as persons experiencing homelessness, this could be game-changing, obviously. And without further ado, let me turn it over to my great colleague, Jen Pyle. Thanks, James. So let's go ahead and take it into the misinformation front. So this case is called Murty versus Missouri. And what this case is about is uh, challengers, Missouri, Louisiana, and individual challengers suing the Biden administration over what they argue is open, quote, open and explicit censorship uh, via the administration's efforts to tamp down on social media misinformation. Um, this includes election related information. This includes COVID-19 related information. So, um, you know, looking through the, the, the pleadings in the case, the COVID-19 information, uh, misinformation in question, allegedly included information about COVID-19's lab leak origins, uh, the inefficacy of masks, of, of lockdowns, of vaccines, allegations that natural immunity is more effective than vaccines, that vaccine mandates are dangerous, indications that young children should not be subject to mask mandates and should not utilize masks, and much more. Um, and in July 2023, a district judge agreed with these challengers and issued a pretty wide ranging, broad ruling attempting to prevent Biden administration officials and others from communicating with social media companies about moderation and about removal of misinformation on their platforms pursuant to the First Amendment freedom of speech. Um, and the Supreme Court agreed to take up this case and basically address this particular issue. You know, is this actually a First Amendment violation or is it not? So next slide. The public health impacts of this case are pretty profound. Uh, addressing misinformation, especially post-COVID, and in this new AI arena that we find ourselves in, it's emerging as a key priority for public health actors. Uh, stymieing public health actors' abilities to address that misinformation can just lead to broader misinformation circulation and subsequent negative health outcomes. And, you know, you don't have to take it from me. You can take it from FDA Commissioner Dr. Robert Califf, who explained a few months ago that life expectancy is looking worse. And what he sees as a new factor in that equation is increased misinformation information circulating in online sources. Um, he said specifically, quote, you think about the impact of a single person reaching a billion people on the internet all over the world. We just weren't prepared for that. We don't have societal rules that are adjudicating it quite right. And I think it's impacting our health in very detrimental ways. Next slide. So the forecast on this case, though, is actually partly sunny. We have already heard oral argument in this case, and that gives us a really good sense of maybe where the court is going to go here. And the real question in this case is, do we actually have state action? Do we actually have something that the government did that that really violates First Amendment rights? Or is it what the social media companies did, right? Is it the social media companies moderating their own platforms? So what the court was really looking for in this oral argument was, is there enough coercion from the federal government on these social media companies that, that rises to the level of government actually interfering with free speech rights? And it seemed 
broadly from a number of the justices' questions, including Chief Justice Roberts, that they probably weren't finding this action to be entirely coercive. And so it's possible that um, that there is no real First Amendment violation going to going to come out of this case. Next slide. Okay, so let's shift into reproductive health and reproductive rights. Um, and there are a couple of Supreme Court cases here that, that we should talk about. Um, and so the first one is one that we have heard oral arguments on. They occurred at the end of March. Um, and this case deals with medication abortion, mifepristone specifically. So mifepristone is an FDA approved medication abortion drug that originally came to the market over 20 years ago. Um, and in this case, challengers, uh, including a medical organization and a few um, a few specific uh, practicing physicians, uh, wanted to challenge FDA's approval of mifepristone and its loosening of restrictions on mifepristone, which it had done in 2016 and 2021. And the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals in this case said, mm, this was approved like 20 years ago, so it's probably been too long to actually challenge the full approval of mifepristone. You, you, you know, you slept on that a little bit. It's kind of time barred. But we can take a look at that 2016 and that 2021 loosening of restrictions when FDA made mifepristone just more easily accessible. And we can take a look at that. And you know what? We agree with you, challengers. Um, FDA acted unlawfully when it took actions to loosen and, and uh and make mifepristone more widely available. Um, for a number of different reasons, the Fifth Circuit um, mostly hung its hat on the fact that perhaps FDA didn't consider all sides of the issue um, and all the evidence um, when they were making that determination. So um, just to put it into context though, what, what did those 2016 and 2021 uh, restriction alterations do? What, what is that Fifth Circuit, if that Fifth Circuit decision is affirmed by the U.S. Supreme Court, what does that practically do with mifepristone? Well, mifepristone will no longer be accessible by mail. It will require three in-person visits to obtain the medication, to take it in front of the medical professional to be seen at follow-up. It will not be available at pharmacies. It will only be available to be collected from a medical professional in a clinic setting. Um, those are all the changes that happened in 2016 and 2021. And that's where we would sort of rewind to if this decision was upheld. Next slide. So beyond that, though, beyond the, the clear um, change in access availability to mifepristone um, are the more general public health implications of this decision. This case is really the first true attempt to fully overturn an FDA approval of a safe and effective medication. And the, the federal district court in this case actually would have allowed that to happen, would have pulled mifepristone off of the market in its entirety. Um, and so allowing this case to go forward at all throws every single FDA approval into question. It places those determinations in the hands of non-expert judges across the country. Um, and, you know, other doctors, other organizations might come out to, in droves to sort of start to challenge all different kinds of FDA approved medications and FDA approval determinations that have already been determined safe and effective and that we're already using in the U.S. So um, this is going to, potentially give more judges, again, who don't have that um, scientific expertise, kind of an outside amount of control over the drugs that we can take and the drugs that are available to us if this decision, you know, goes that way. Uh, next slide. So after saying all that, you're probably wondering, why is there a beautiful sunny sky in this forecast? Well, we, as I said, had an oral argument in this case. So we know really well how the ju the justices might come out on this issue. And during the oral argument, instead of really asking a lot of questions about, did FDA act unlawfully? Did FDA review all of the evidence? What the justices instead focused on was standing. And standing is a concept that's kind of confusing in law school and it could take a while to explain. So let's just boil it down really quickly. Essentially, in order to um, to hear a case, in order for federal courts to hear a case, there has to be a real injury at stake. There has to be skin in the game. There has to be a real injury that the defendant caused that the court can address. And that keeps the courts from essentially writing whatever law they want to in, in, in whatever way they want to. They have to know we're adjudicating a real case with a real injured party here. 
And from the, the justices questioning in this case, it kind of seems like they don't think there's a real injured party here because there's a long chain of sort of unattenuated events. Um, these challenging doctors are essentially saying, we don't prescribe mifepristone. Um, we object to prescribing mifepristone, but maybe another doctor would prescribe mifepristone and maybe that patient would be harmed from taking mifepristone. And maybe that patient then would wind up in front of me at my ER. And then maybe I would have to be involved in the care of that person and I object to that. And that kind of attenuation is not normally what you look for when you're looking for a real injury that's really concrete and has occurred. And, and a lot of the justices seem to, to take issue with that. So it's possible that this case never should have gotten this far to begin with. Next slide. So next up is our case number five, and it's another reproductive health case. This case deals with EMTALA, uh, the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act. It's a federal law. It applies to most U.S. hospitals, and it requires emergency stabilizing treatment where the life or health of a person is in jeopardy, generally. This has been pretty complicated post uh, Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, where the U where the uh, United States Supreme Court overturned the constitutional right to abortion, because now there's this kind of potential for very restrictive state abortion laws to conflict with this federal law. Um, some state laws, for example, like Idaho's, which is at issue in this case, only allow an, ex an, an exception to a stringent abortion ban where the life of the pregnant individual is in jeopardy. But EMTALA, as I just mentioned to you, allows, you know, requires that stabilizing treatment if the life or the health is in serious jeopardy. And so does EMTALA actually come in here and preempt that state law that is even more restrictive and say, no, 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 Idaho, you also have to allow doctors to comply with EMTALA and to act when the health of that pregnant person is in jeopardy as well. Um, and so this case is an interesting one because we've seen sort of a circuit split forming on this issue where the Ninth Circuit has said, yes, EMTALA does preempt the state law, but then uh, additional challenges occurred in Texas. Um, and in Texas, in the Fifth Circuit said, no, EMTALA does not preempt here and the states can go ahead and ban. So the U.S. Supreme Court entering into this fray will kind of resolve that question on a, on a national scale. Next slide. So from a public health impacts perspective, millions of pregnancy-capable individuals in states across the country, um, which have made it more difficult to get access to abortions in a post-Dobbs world. Um, and with a bad outcome from this decision, what you have is a situation where more patients are are potentially placed in jeopardy or potentially need to face fully life-threatening circumstances in order to get access to the procedure rather than simply health-threatening circumstances. And pushing that treatment out even further could, could result in really negative deleterious health outcomes on a grand scale nationwide. Next slide. So the forecast here is looking pretty rough. Um, it's, we're on tornado watch, in my opinion, um, and we have not heard the oral argument for this case yet. So that will shed some light and maybe change this forecast, depending on how that argument goes. That argument is next week on Wednesday. So if you're interested, um, you can sort of follow, you know, reporting that will take place after the fact. Um, but, you know, as I mentioned, um, the potential here is for even pregnant people facing serious health threatening, potentially long term health threatening impacts might not be able to gain access to to abortion care um, and might have to wait until their condition is literally determined to be life threatening pursuant to a restrictive state law. Um, again, potential for more bad outcomes there. Next slide. So just to cap, this is not a U.S. Supreme Court case, but why is the EMTALA decision so important for us here in our home state of Arizona? Well, let's take a look at what just happened in our state Supreme Court on April 9th, um, only, you know, a, a few days ago at this point. Um, the Arizona Supreme Court 
In its case, Planned Parenthood versus Hazelrig took on the question of whether the Arizona legislature had repealed an 1864 near total abortion ban when it passed other abortion statutes like the 15 week ban that was passed in 2022 in the lead up to the Dobbs decision coming out. Next slide. This has been all over major news media all across the country. So I would not be surprised if many of you have already, you know, seen what the outcome of this decision was. But let's let's tackle it. Let's take it apart a little bit. So uh, we have a majority. Um, a majority is four justices um, in this case. Um, only six justices were on the bench making this decision. Justice William Montgomery recused himself. Um, but in the majority in this decision, uh, you have four justices, Justice John Lopez, Justice Clint Bullock, Justice James Bean, and Justice Catherine King. And in a majority opinion written by Justice John Lopez, essentially, um, the Arizona Supreme Court said that 1864 full near full ban on abortions can be enforced. It is valid and it can be enforced in the state of Arizona, regardless of the 15 week abortion ban that was passed only a few years ago. Um, and they came to this reason. They came to this conclusion um, through a, a couple of different reasons. So uh, the first one is they said the 15 week statute text was ambiguous. Um, they said it was ambiguous because the 15-week statute didn't actually give any indication of its impact on the 1864 ban. Um, and so read that it was ambiguous because it didn't say in the specific language of the statute how it would impact that ban. Um, and when a statute is ambiguous, then the court can go beyond the text of the statute. And so they say, it's ambiguous. We can reach beyond the text to find out what it means. We can look for legislative intent from other sources. Sometimes they do that by, you know, looking up um, language in the dictionary or, or looking at, as in here, notes of construction. Notes of construction that the legislature had put not into the text of the statute, but but uh, when it passed the statute, it passed it with these notes of, con of construction in mind. And it said... Um, this, this 15 week law does not repeal the 1864 ban. And this 15 week law does not create a, a right to abortion in the state of Arizona. We do not intend to do that with this law. And because those two things were in the construction notes of, of a, uh, an ambiguous statute, um, the Arizona Supreme Court essentially said the legislature clearly doesn't want to stand in the way of this 1864 ban. And the only reason that they were was because of Roe and because of its requirement to, you know, allow a constitutional right to abortion. And now that Roe is gone, the legislature doesn't want to stand in the way. We can go ahead and re and, and enforce this 1864 ban again. Next slide. So you have a dissent from two justices. Um, Vice Chief Justice Ann Scott Timmer wrote the dissent and she was joined by Chief Justice Robert Brutonell. And their reason, they had a, a, a number of reasons why they disagreed with the majority, but I've just pinpointed a couple of them here. First of all, um, they said the 15 week abortion ban was not ambiguous. The text on the page allowed abortions up to 15 weeks. That's not ambiguous. There's no need to leave that text and go look at the construction notes. We don't need to do that. It's, it's clear on the text that's in front of us. Um, second, they thought that, you know, it doesn't matter whether the 15 week statute gave an affirmative right to abortion or not. It still allowed abortions up to 15 weeks. Um, and, and that's just kind of how laws work. Uh, Justice Timmer uh, gave an example of sort of a uh, like a speed limit. You know, if you have a 45 mile an hour speed limit, you don't think that you have an inherent right, an individual right to drive 20 20 miles an hour or 35 miles an hour, but you know you're not going to go to jail for it. You know you're not going to get prosecuted for it. So it protects that access um, in and of itself. It doesn't need to expressly say we provide a right in order for that access still to be protected in that statute. Finally, um, you know, as I mentioned in the previous slide, the majority sort of took the stance of, you know, the legislature's uh, never wanted to get rid of this 1864 ban, but their hand was forced by Roe. 
Roe was in the way. And so they felt like they had to pass this 15 week ban, even though they would prefer the 1864 ban because Roe was still in place at the time. But that doesn't actually make a whole lot of sense when you think about what Roe really said, because under Roe, a 15 week ban would also have been unconstitutional. Under Roe, um, abortion access until viability is an individual right, which is roughly at, you know, 24 weeks of gestation. So this still would have been unconstitutional by a good nine weeks under Roe. And therefore, it might not make much sense to say that Roe forced this this legislature to take this action. Next slide. So the practical results for the for the near future of this decision are that the 1864 ban is going to become enforceable. It's going to become enforceable basically 60 days from April 9th. Um, and the reason for that is because prior AZ, uh, Attorney General Mark Brnovich had agreed not to enforce anything for 45 days uh, following a final judgment from the appeals court in this case. Um, and the final judgment actually doesn't issue until 15 days after April 9th. So that's where the 60 days comes in, that 15 day sort of wait to issue a final decision and then 45 days after that. Okay, the penalty, two to five years in prison for anyone convicted, that potentially stretches beyond just doctors. The language in the 1864 ban is pretty broad. It doesn't say physicians. Um, so it could be interpreted more broadly than that. Attorney General Chris Mays has stated that she won't prosecute anybody under the 1864 law. But um, compared with other felonies in the state of Arizona, um, felonies of this kind of class generally have a statute of limitations of seven years. And that would that would outlast a Chris Mays administration. That would push into a potential new administration that may change its mind and may want to enforce this law. Um, finally, 1864, um, that ban, the only exception under it is where an abortion is necessary to save the life of the mother. Um, but the term necessary to save the life is undefined in that statute. Um, and it's undefined, it's not defined in any court decision that I've seen. Um, so we don't know what it means. Under the 15 week ban, we had emergency circumstances and that was very, very explicitly defined. It laid out very, very, uh, very targeted specifics about when a medical emergency is occurring and when an exception can be made, um, you know, lasting impacts on reproductive system or um, impacts on your circulatory system, like things like that. It really tied in sort of medical um, information uh, into the statute to give physicians a sort of sense of what that medical emergency would mean. There's no such thing here. There's no clear definition of when something is necessary to save the life of the person involved. Um, and in fact, in Hazelrig, the Arizona Supreme Court actually said in a footnote, we're not going to define that. It's not properly before us. So what that means is that there's a real chilling effect on physicians providing any kind of abortion access because they might wonder, is this one that is actually fully going to be considered life-saving or is it not? And by the way, if it's not, I'm risking two to five years in prison. I'm risking losing my medical license. I'm, you know, I'm risking all of those things. So potentially more litigation, potentially a big chilling effect on, on physicians um, because that, that language is not defined. Next slide. Okay, so what now? There are, this is so far from resolved um, in the state of Arizona. There is gonna be a lot more action on this uh, in the next few months and certainly leading up to the election. Um, we know that there's potential for a new constitutional amendments on the ballot um, that potentially protect uh, abortion access as enshrined in the Arizona Constitution. There's also some reporting about um, alternative ballot initiatives being proposed potentially by the legislature that would provide some sort of distinct kind of um, protection or approach to the abortion issue. Um, there's potential for new legislation. Um, the Arizona legislature has been uh, not very quickly moving on this, um, but there is the potential that, you know, the legislature could repeal that 1864 ban or could pass a new law that does say it, you know, it, it repeals that. Um, and finally, new new lawsuits, right? New lawsuits to determine when is the, when is it actually necessary to save the life of the mother? 
or potentially new lawsuits from county attorneys who might want to prosecute, despite the fact that Chris Mays does not want to prosecute um, Attorney General Chris Mays. There's medical board discipline and potentially medical board discipline, even in the absence of a conviction because of really broadly drafted language in the medical board disciplinary statute and, and regulations. Um, gubernatorial pardon power could come into play if any of these um, prosecutions do result in conviction. And finally, this is a, a year where two of the justices uh, on the Arizona Supreme Court are on the ballot for retention, Justice King and Justice Bullock. So we'll we'll kind of be watching to see what happens in this landscape. But, um, but that Mtala decision and the fact that our Arizona 1864 law says it has an exception only for the life, and Mtala has exceptions for life and health, that Amtala decision could really impact what's going on on the ground in Arizona. Next slide. So with that, I think we are done with our top five and a bonus Arizona focus um, discussion. And I'll turn it over to Swapna for Q&A. Thank you so much. Thank you for that excellent presentation. Um, lots going on, lots going on at the Supreme Court, lots going on in at the Arizona Supreme Court as well. And speaking of lots going on, there's lots going on in our Q&A. And so we have many different questions. Um, and and I and actually, we're not going to have all the time to get to everything. And so I'm going to try to kind of cruise through a few of these. There's a, And I'll, I'll, I'll summarize a few as well, and I'll do my best to do so. A few different folks have asked questions about standing as it relates to the Mtala case. And we're wondering if you can clarify that a little bit. Where is the standing there? And, and or it, does that not apply to this particular case folks are asking? I, I don't think the standing issue has has been a particular issue in the Mtala case. Um, I I think uh, I think that the FDA case is so much more um, so much more attenuated in terms of the circumstances that are occurring um, because they they are challenging mifepristone, which they are not prescribing, and and which you know maybe one day potentially a patient winds up in your ER that you have to treat that did take mifepristone from another doctor and had these complications, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Very attenuated. I think the Amtala case has has less attenuation um, because all that really considers is a person in a medical emergency showing up at the hospital ER. Um, and that happens all the time. That happens pretty frequently. And so um, I, I haven't seen that standing issue really posing a problem to the Amtala case. I don't, I don't think it'll come up too much. All right. Thank you. And here's, here's another question, speaking of the FDA case. So if the, if that case is found for Alliance, could that affect other FDA approved drugs? I mean, what are sort of the larger implications here for the FDA and the role and the power of the FDA? 100%. Now, maybe not directly, because this case deals with mifepristone and mifepristone alone, right? But if this case moves forward, if, if the Supreme Court says, yes, Alliance, you were injured here, you can bring this lawsuit, then that means other other medical organizations and other doctors can bring similar lawsuits to challenge whatever FDA approved drug they want to, um, based on the fact that maybe some other doctor prescribed that drug and eventually maybe I'd get a patient that took it and got injured from it. Injuries happen, adverse events happen. Um, that is all part of the calculus when FDA is approving something. You know, is it safe and effective? When we're looking at if it's safe, we're looking at if the benefits outweigh the risks, because it's very rare that there's no risk profile whatsoever when it comes to a drug. And so you could find a, a problem with any with any drug, right, and say, uh oh, well, maybe one day that patient winds up in front of me and, and I have a problem with that and I want to challenge that. So it does open the potential floodgates of litigation to challenge whatever FDA approved drug um, if this case does uh, does get to go forward. Um, and, and yeah, in that way, it really does kind of dilute the authority of FDA to say, these drugs are safe and effective. We put them through, you know, years of study and, and, and years of review and years of analysis and assessment because at the end of the day, if one judge in one district in the in the United States can can say, I, I disagree, 
okay, that, that then it's shut down. Then potentially that access is shut down entirely. Yeah, thank you. Pretty wide ranging implications there. So I'm going to rewind to kind of the top of the hour. And, and James, I'm going to throw this question over to you, uh, especially regarding the unhoused population and the case regarding the unhoused population, which is, so in Phoenix, when people are um, unhoused in the summer and they have a high risk of dying, obviously due to our extreme heat and the conditions related, are, would public health officials have more authority to take them to a safer location and out of the heat? How would folks like right here in our community be most affected? Well, that's a great question, Swapna, because I mean, obviously we're at epicenter of some of the most profound homelessness issues in the United States with some of the issues that people face here in the summer and, of course, other persons in other locales during the wintertime. But the the elements and where and how persons can gain access out of that is a big part of what you may see changing after a case like this. If the Supreme Court goes the route of accepting the case to directly challenge the Ninth Circuit's longstanding opinion that there are Eighth Amendment protections at play here that do not allow communities to simply oust homeless persons because of various different loitering laws or camping laws or other provisions, this could be real big trouble for how actually some cities can start to discriminate against persons experiencing homelessness. It's not so much a matter of whether or how this court may actually leave in place the Ninth Circuit, I'm, Ninth Circuit opinions on these particular fronts. That's not why this court took this case on, was to say status quo is quite agreeable and Ninth Circuit's got this right. I, I think you're going to see a change in policy. That's going to lead to actually public health authorities having to fight or battle even more so for the types of protections they may want to put into place. There's been constitutional protection for persons experiencing homelessness against that backdrop leading up to this point. I suspect that's going to be diminished, if not taken away, at least under Eighth Amendment perspective, leaving behind a much more spacious liberty interest that persons may have that can always be succumbed to specific measures and local interventions. The long and short of it is swapping in for everybody experiencing, you know, or worried about these specific issues, get ready for cities and localities to be able to start dictating to greater degree what and how homelessness will be tolerated in their community. And the repercussions for persons in that specific realm, again, noting several hundred thousand people in any given night in the United States experiencing homelessness could really get, well, frankly, ugly in the United States. We will see what comes from it. We've got all the arguments on Monday, and we'll have a lot better sense of where the court may be willing to go with this. Again, I don't think they took the case to affirm the Ninth Circuit lower court opinion. Thank you for that clarification. And yeah, I mean, huge implications just for us in our in our own community. I know the three of us sit in downtown Phoenix. Our offices are in downtown Phoenix and just around the corner from where our offices are. I mean, huge implications for for the significant unhoused populations there. So I'm gonna I'm gonna fast forward a little bit um, and and let's talk and there's there's quite a few questions kind of related to the level of certainty uh, that physicians need to have that are required to have to determine if a situation is a life or death or life threatening type of uh, a medical condition or pregnancy in order to legally receive abortion care. How, how do physicians figure this out? How do they make this determination? How certain do they need to be? Swapna, that is such a good question. And it's a, unfortunately one that we don't really have a solid legal answer to right now in the state of Arizona. And that's why this is so problematic. So um, Dobbs really put this, you know, put physicians in a in a precarious situation because it enabled states to fully outright ban abortion with very limited exception to save the life of the pregnant person. And a lot of legislatures had those laws on the books. I mean, ours is from 1864. It's from the Civil War, right? And so they have those laws on the books, which without ever defining medically or 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 without ever specifically saying in the statute um the good faith determination of the physician in the good faith medical opinion of the physician um the, that 1864 law doesn't have that in there so we don't know we just don't know um the 15 week ban did 
specifically say as a judge in the good faith of the of the medical provider you know on the basis of the best medical evidence out there so the the standard there really is good faith are you are you reasonably coming to this determination based on some kind of you know medical background or information or 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 knowledge that you bring to the table um here we don't even have that we don't even have a good faith protection we just have necessary to save the life and who knows what that means and and the problem when it comes to defining what that means is that a physician is going to have to take that risk a physician is going to have to say you know what i think this is a situation where that matters and where that where that where that kicks into place and potentially face down prosecution for it in order for us to spell out in the courts Yes, that is an actual exception under this language. Yeah, thank you for that. And I know we have we actually have a decent number of physicians uh, attending this presentation today. So I know that's you know top of mind and 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 can be a precarious situation for our health professionals. So I have a I have a two part question, and this I feel like this is taking me back to first year law school kind of con law class and some of these questions, but here's, here's a really good one. So we have, as you mentioned, that 160 year old um, plus year old uh, a law from before Arizona was even a state. So the question is, can you explain how a ban from before Arizona was even a state can still be effect today? Yes, I can. Um, <laughs> but also a lot of it is just because the Arizona Supreme Court says so, um, because the Arizona Supreme Court told us in Hazel Rig, yeah, go ahead, enforce it. Um, that was their decision. That was their decision, a majority decision. Um, but behind their decision was the fact that the Arizona legislature has had 160 years to repeal this law and never did. And there was another law on the books that criminalized women getting abortions that they did repeal. So we know it's possible for them to repeal laws. Um, and they just never did. They never did. And so it was still sitting on the books in 1970 when Roe came down. Um, it was permanently blocked from being enforced in 1973 when Roe came down. And they still never took it off the books. And so it it, it is really weird to be in a situation where we, we're living in 2024 and all of a sudden, you know, we've been taken back 160 years to the Civil War based on this one Arizona Supreme Court decision. But they they saw a law that had never been pulled off the books by the legislature and in their determination, OK, then that means we can go ahead and resuscitate it. And, and it can apply once more. Got it. And here we are. And uh, so then here, I'll, I'll send this one over to, to, to Professor Hodge. Uh, it's a good, speaking of kind of constitutional questions here, here's another one, which is for this Arizona decision, is it constitutional for, for Attorney General Chris, Chris Mays to remove prosecuting power from the county attorneys? And if you can give a little bit of sort of background for that question, I think that that would be really helpful as well. Well, that's a good one, because, you know, what Jen mentioned is the notion that if we did have a favorable uh, person like Chris May saying, basically, I'm not prosecuting, I'm not going to go forward and prosecute any person who's providing an abortion under these particular circumstances, that can be very favorable because it actually at least gives doctors and others some sense that they could go forward with abortions that are considered lawful and not be prosecuted for questionable calls. But as Jen also noted, can she control for county prosecutors? trying to make the same basic statement, or I'm sorry, trying to go against that basic statement. That's one of Arizona state law. It might be deferential to Jen on this because she's looked into this most recently following what we saw in Hazel Rig, but the reality is the AG may be compressed in her complete ability to actually circumvent what a, what a county prosecutor with his or her own authority to prosecute under, under you know, that particular jurisdiction could be problematic, but to the degree to which it would be considered a state crime and brought up before this specific attorney general, she's made very clear, at least in several statements, she would not prosecute persons under those circumstances. Jen, how about her ability to circumvent a county prosecutor? Any thoughts? Yeah, yeah, a couple of thoughts. So first of all, back in 2023, when this was all starting to really pop off, um, uh, Governor Hobbs, 
Governor Hobbs signed an executive order saying, I'm going to go ahead and consolidate all prosecutorial authority on that 1864 law in A.G. Chris Mays because (laughs) we don't know what's going to happen with it. Right. And so I just want to make sure that Chris Mays can make those calls. And so that executive order has never been challenged in court. um, But could it be now? Could it be now that this law is awake again and wandering around and potentially there for county prosecutors to seize upon? Yeah, sure. We So so at the end of the day, it's more lawsuits. <laughs> it's more litigation. We're just kind of in this in this cycle where maybe these county prosecutors try to challenge that executive order. If they do, um, Chris Mays has also said, I have very broad um, sort of supervisory authority over county attorneys anyway. And so I can use that supervisory authority to say, hey, knock it off. Don't go after this kind of case. Um, I'm supervising you and I'm telling you to stop. But at the end of the day, then we could see a challenge to that. We could see a legal challenge to that. So it kind of is just lawsuits all of the way down until we see legislative change or ballot initiative change or something, you know, substantial and long lasting that can that can address this law. Thank you. Thank you for that. And here's and we don't have much time left. And so maybe I'll do a two part question um, that that actually impacts uh, the larger health policy questions we see in general, which is someone asked, how involved are subject matter experts um, in developing legislation? How often do policymakers or those on the bench uh, consult subject matter experts when they're making these kind of life and death decisions, right, that are impacting the lives of so many people? And then the follow up question to that, and then maybe one, maybe either James or Jen can take on that first, you know, small question. And then uh, one of you, the other one can take on the second part of that, which is folks want to know if they're in, if they are healthcare professionals themselves or in the healthcare industry, what is the best way for them to get involved from an advocacy perspective to influence some of these issues, whether it's from a legislative perspective or public education perspective? Good stuff, Swapna. Jen, let me defer to you on that first question, if you'd like. Sure. So, so the real best answer I can say is, is I'm honestly not sure how often uh, legislators really take into account subject matter experts when they're drafting this these these kinds of laws. Um, it, I'm sh- I'm certain it happens. I'm certain it doesn't always happen. Um, and and you know they have the power to write the laws. Um, and you know, it's not just subject matter experts that might be consulted. It's also um organizations that are very interested in a particular legal policy that sort of um consult and or provide model language for legislatures to take up and use. Um, so it. It could be subject matter experts. It could be, you know, motivated policy um, organizations that are trying to push that a a different kind of agenda or a specific kind of agenda. Um, In terms of um, judges, I mean, I mean, let's take a look at this FDA versus, you know, Alliance of Hippocratic Medicine case just really quick again, because this case involves a federal judge questioning all of FDA's subject matter expertise in in his opinion. And actually, as we've come to learn after the fact, relying on a couple of studies to say FDA acted unlawfully, relying on a couple of studies that have since been retracted from the journals that initially published them as being uh, full of conflicts of interest, as being funded by, you know, anti-abortion organizations. And so mm, that that that's the problem with, you know, um, a non-subject matter expert taking on maybe what looks like expertise might not always be the case. Yeah, good stuff. Swapna, let me let me try to clarify something here that may help just everybody trying to see what, what role can they play, no matter what side of these debates you may be on, what role can you play against this backdrop? And let's be really clear about just what the Supreme Court and Arizona Supreme Court cases mean. When the U.S. Supreme Court issues an opinion on constitutional law, that opinion is final. They're the final arbiter. They make that decision. That's what we've vested with them. When Arizona Supreme Court makes a determination on its sort of statutory law assessment, that is fungible. That can change. And as Jen was noting, with all of those bubbles on slide in that last illustration we saw, 
There are so many factors at work here in relation to decisions like we see in Hazelrig that are subject to change as contrasted with when the U.S. Supreme Court issues an opinion saying constitutional law says what it says because we're the final arbiters. That we have to work around like we've seen with Dobbs and other fronts. But on every other opportunity, the fungible, fungible nature of what's open forum and what's available to Americans and Arizonans to actually address these specific issues, it's out front, it's available, take advantage of it. Well said. Thank you so much. I feel like we could go on and on and we have so many questions and I'm sorry to everyone whose questions we did not get to, but thank you so much for your engagement. We have to wrap up today. Thank you so much, James. Thank you so much, um, uh, Jen, for joining us. Thank you for all this excellent information. I just want to let you all know that if you'd like to know more about topics like this or any other really important healthcare topics, please join us on our social media pages. Um, and please join us for our next health talk on July 18th, which has the absolutely spectacular title, Hot and Bothered, a conversation about heat and health. Uh, details and registrations are on our asuhealthtalks.com website. Thank you all again so much. Have an absolutely beautiful day. And thank you so much to our speakers. Thank you, Swapna. Have a great one. Thank you. Thank you.